What's going on, my lovely people? This is Medicosis Perfect Genetics, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our five-minute review playlist. Today, we'll talk about the cardiovascular changes that happen normally during pregnancy. Let's go. This is my playlist. Here are some very quick reviews. All right, let's go back to square one. Endocrinology basics. We start with the hypothalamus in the brain, which secretes GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Gonado because we're targeting the gonads, such as the ovaries or the testicles. Releasing hormone because they will release the gonadotropins. So these are the gonadotropins. Above them, you have the gonadotropin releasing hormone. All right. Now the hypothalamus secretes GnRH. It's going to go to the anterior pituitary, and then the anterior pituitary is stimulated. All right, I'm submitted to do what? To secrete FSH and LH. FSH is the follicle-stimulating hormone. You will stimulate those follicles in the ovary until they mature like this. It becomes mature, graphian follicle. Until the LH comes and pew, ruptures that follicle, releasing the ovum into the fallopian tube. The rest of the follicle will become the corpus luteum. That's why we call it the luteinizing hormone, because it gives you the luteal body or the corpus luteum. The word luteal means what? Yellow. The ovary itself is an endocrine organ too. It secretes estrogen and progesterone. And in pregnancy, boy, do you have lots of estrogen and progesterone. Do you remember cardiac output? Yeah, cardiac output is the output of the heart. It's what's coming out of the heart. All right. It's five liters per minute normally. And this depends on what? How fast and how strong the heart is beating. How fast is called the heart rate. How strong is called the stroke volume. In pregnancy, there is tons of estrogens and progesterone. They will raise the stroke volume and raise the heart rate. The end result is an increase in the cardiac output. Easy peasy. Why is that useful? Because now you've got to supply the mommy and the baby. Oh, so you need lots of cardiac output because now you have one heart supplying two people. Oh, that makes sense. Let's review some anatomy. We start here by your left ventricle and then boom, the aorta starts as ascending aorta, then aortic arch and then descending thoracic aorta. Then it's going to appear beneath the diaphragm and it's going to change its name into the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta is to the left, inferior vena cava is to the right. Let's go back to your miserable biology classes. Arteries versus veins. Which ones have stronger, thicker walls? Arteries, of course. Which ones have higher pressures? Arteries, of course. Okay. Since veins have lower pressure, therefore veins are more easily compressed. That makes sense. So keep that in mind because we're gonna use it soon. Now back to progesterone and estrogen. Source, ovary, stimulus. We start by the hypothalamus secreting GnRH, then the anterior pituitary secreting FSH and LH, and then the ovary making estrogen and progesterone. What's the function of progesterone and estrogen? It's to maintain the endometrium. It's to feed the endometrium. It's to make that endometrial lining grow robust to sustain the embryo. In other words, if you go to a public library and find a book that has a title of Quote, how to maintain an endometrium, you will find estrogen and progesterone on the cover page. Especially progesterone. All right, how to maintain an endometrium. Progesterone increases blood vessel diameter. So now we have more vessels going to the uterus. And not only this, these vessels are larger in diameter. Okay, when you increase the diameter, you'll increase the blood flow to the uterus. That's true. Now, many students are confused here because they say, Hey, medicosis, I know that when the diameter of the vessel goes up, that the velocity is going to go down. Yes, that's true, but no one is talking about velocity here. We're talking about the flow. When you increase the diameter of the vessel, the flow will go up. Okay? Yep. More blood is going to the uterus. Nice. And then the uterine glands will grow and blush and start to secrete because these secretions come from where? From the blood. If you have more blood, you will have more gland secretions. Let's have a pharmacology tie. What's the mechanism of action of phenylephrine? Phenylephrine is an alpha agonist. It constricts vessels. Yeah, that's why we use it as a decongestant. How come? Because when you constrict the blood vessels in your nose, you will have a less runny nose. But how? Because when I constrict the blood vessels in your nose, this will decrease the blood flow 
and therefore decrease the gland secretions because the mucus in your nose is coming from the blood vessels. Oh, it's coming from the blood. Yeah, when you constrict the blood, you'll decrease the secretions. Conversely, when you increase the blood flow and dilate the vessels, you will increase the uterine gland secretions. You may be trying to create a more just society, but progesterone is trying to create a more robust endometrium. If progesterone can cause all of this in the uterus, it can also cause all of this outside the uterus. Yeah, increase the diameter of all blood vessels will decrease the total peripheral resistance and decrease my blood pressure. That's why you get what? Hypotension in pregnancy, spider angiomata, telangiectasia, pulmonary erythema, vasodilation. These same symptoms can be seen in a 69-year-old patient who works as a farmer in Sudan. This patient has a huge liver and a gigantic spleen. What's the diagnosis? Probably cirrhosis. Why Sudan? Aspergillus fumigatus. If I have cirrhosis of the liver, why do I get these symptoms? Because I have cirrhosis in the liver, I cannot metabolize progesterone and estrogen. And what do progesterone and estrogen do? They dilate vessels. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. More blood flow to every part of my body, hyperdynamic circulation, heart rate is going to go up. You can get an innocent flow systolic murmur. Increased body temperature, which happens in the second half of every menstrual cycle. It's because of progesterone. Also, you increase the renal plasma flow and the GFR of the kidney. As you know, your blood is made of plasma and blood cells, especially red blood cells. Plasma will increase in its volume. Red blood cell mass will increase in pregnancy. Where does your saliva come from? From the blood, urine, from the blood. How about the endometrial gland secretions? Also from the blood. That's why we are dilating vessels. That's why we are recruiting more vessels to the uterus. And that's why we are increasing the red blood cell mass and the plasma volume during pregnancy. During pregnancy, both are going up, but the rise in the plasma volume exceeds the rise in the red blood cell mass. And that's why hematocrit drops. Because hematocrit is the red blood cell volume over the total blood volume. So when both of these rise, but the rise in plasma exceeds the rise in red blood cells, the hematocrit will drop. Is this a true anemia? Shut up! It's a dilutional effect or dilutional anemia, which is a pseudo anemia. It's not a true anemia. Do not blame the red blood cells. Blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. The arterial blood pressure has two components, systolic and diastolic. Okay, blood pressure is cardiac output times TPR. TPR will influence the diastolic and the systolic, but it influences the diastolic way more than its influence on the systolic. Conversely, cardiac output can change the systolic or the diastolic, but it has more influence on the systolic than on the diastolic. During pregnancy, cardiac output will go up a little, but the total peripheral resistance will drop a lot because progesterone is dilating vessels, and that's why blood pressure should drop. If total peripheral resistance is dropping like this, who do you think is gonna decrease more? Systolic or diastolic blood pressure? Diastolic is gonna drop more because the total peripheral resistance contributes to the diastolic more than the systolic. So during pregnancy, systolic is gonna drop, diastolic is gonna drop. So the blood pressure will drop. And that's why hypertension in pregnancy is never normal. No, it's not okay. Because if you take this too far, you can get preeclampsia. And when you have seizure, we call it eclampsia. During pregnancy, cardiac output goes up, total peripheral resistance goes down, blood pressure goes down. When you decrease the resistance, you will increase the flow, which is good for the uterus and good for the uterine glands. Who's more vulnerable, arteries or veins? Veins, they are more easily compressed. That's why... Sleeping on your back is not the best idea because when you sleep on your back, you'll press on the aorta and the IVC. The aorta can handle it because it has stronger walls and higher pressure. The IVC cannot handle the pressure. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the gravid uterus. I'm talking to you, IVC. If mommy sleeps on her back, this can compress the IVC, decrease the venous return and the preload, which will decrease cardiac output, decrease blood pressure, and decrease the uterine perfusion. That's not good for the baby. So that's why we advise mom to sleep on her left side. Why left? Because when you sleep on the left, you are pressing on the aorta, which can handle the pressure, but you're leaving the IVC free to increase the preload increase the cardiac output. Let's talk about veins. 
Here is your right internal jugular vein, right subclavian vein, joined together, right brachiocephalic vein. Same thing happens on the left side. Join that brachiocephalic on the right and on the left, and you get superior vena cava, which drains into the right atrium. Now, do you think pregnancy causes any valvular problem to the tricuspid valve? No. Do you think pregnancy causes right-sided heart failure? Also no. Do you think pregnancy causes heart block? No. Therefore, there is no change to the right atrial pressure, which is known as the central venous pressure, and that's why the right internal jugular vein will be normal. You will not see jugular venous distension in normal pregnancy. So the central venous pressure or the jugular venous pressure is normal during pregnancy. However, the femoral venous pressure will go up. You know why? Because it's hard for the femoral vein to drain upwards when there is a gravid uterus getting in my way. If you watched my video on vitamin B1, we have talked about beriberi. Beriberi was one of the causes of high output cardiac failure or hyperdynamic circulation. Pregnancy can also lead to hyperdynamic circulation, although we will not call it heart failure. And in hyperdynamic circulation, what's going on? Everything is fast, everything is dilated, everything is distended. That's why you get varicose veins. That's why you get an innocent, systolic, soft, musical flow murmur. Jugular venous pressure should be normal. A mild increase is not the end of the world. Blood pressure should go down. After load will go down. If these symptoms are exaggerated in pregnancy, plus mommy has fever or hypothermia, think of sepsis. Here is the difference between the innocent murmur and pathological murmur. Innocent is always systolic. Diastolic murmur is always a pathology during pregnancy. Flow murmurs should be systolic, never diastolic. These lovely innocent murmurs are usually low grade, one or two, but if they are five or six, that's a pathology. These lovely flow murmurs are caused by increased blood flow. Even you can have this murmur after intense exercise. Innocent murmurs have no clicks and they are soft or musical in sound. A murmur during normal pregnancy should never be diastolic, should never be holosystolic or late systolic, should never be continuous, should never be high grade, and should never cause cyanosis or syncope. If you see any of these, there is a pathology. Do an echo. Quiz time. During pregnancy, what's going to happen to all of these parameters? Will they stay the same? Will they go up? Will they go down? Let me know the answers in the comment section. To learn more about estrogen and progesterones, check out my endocrine pharmacology course on my website. If you want to learn more about antiarrhythmics, check out my cardiac pharmacology course. If you want to learn about renal blood flow, renal plasma flow, GFR, factors affecting GFR, the physiology of the kidney, proximal tubule, loop of Hanley distal tubule, I have a renal physiology course also on my website, medicosisperfectionalist.com. Sorry if the video took more than five minutes. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. See you later. Be safe. Stay happy. Study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.